Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar where I'll be talking about something that is very, very important to anyone who works in the education sector. Now, I begin most of these webinars by saying, this strategy is super duper important and you should implement it all the time and yada, yada, yada. But this one really is super important and that is rapport building. So there is a never ending amount of research from the 60s right through to today that shows students find it really difficult to learn from people that they dislike. And I don't think that that should come as any surprise if you've ever been in a classroom and you didn't really like the person that was teaching you, whether it was a seminar or whatever, it's really difficult to listen to what they say and to be actively engaged and motivated to learn and to want to learn from that person who is, I guess, the expert. Now, rapport building is basically, as a bit of a working definition, uh, the professional relationship between the student and the teacher. So rapport means that the student likes the teacher, in other words. And it's not like in any type of uh, weird or strange way, uh, it just, but in a very professional sense. So that doesn't mean that the teacher can't tell the student off or that the teacher can't be stern. In fact, there's some more recent research out that shows that students prefer to be in classes with teachers and teacher aides who are very, I guess you could say stern, not aggressive, not uh, angry and not out of control, but uh, on the ball, confident and uh, in charge, I guess you could say. And I, I, I sort of think that's an interesting, uh, I guess that, that has been some interesting research because uh, there's been a big push in the last 10 or 20 years as far as rapport building, as far as that softer side, I guess you could say, of education um, and less of an emphasis on the idea that uh, we can be not tough, but we can be stern. We can put our feet, foot down and we can be in control of the class. So uh, if you do uh, read books and things like that about education, more modern books that come out, even if you just look on Amazon or wherever, um, you'll see that most of them or a lot of them deal with some type of rapport building or relationship building as a central theme. Now, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but there is that more, I guess, a bit of a, a softer, hippie type emphasis on getting along with students uh, without balancing that out with the idea that teachers or teacher aides need to be in control of their class. Now, I, I, I've spent quite a bit of time dealing with that topic and teasing that out a lot uh, in my uh, in the behaviour management type lectures and behaviour management book, uh, but I just wanted to emphasise that because... Um, Again, if you read anything on rapport building or in the education sector these days, it's, uh, I think it's a little bit unbalanced in that sense. So rapport building is about having relationships, positive relationships with students. So you know them, they know you. There's a back and forth respect in a sense, but that doesn't mean that um, you can't tell a student off or you can't um, put consequences in place. And that doesn't mean that they're always going to like you. Some days... They won't be in the best mood um, and some days you won't be in the best mood. But anyway, so I hope that works uh, for you as far as a definition uh, of rapport building. But if you just think of it in terms of equals professional relationship. Professional relationship. So... Um, that's the best definition, I guess, I can think of uh, for a poor building uh, at, this, at this stage. And um, I think that definitely helps us. Now, again, the research is quite clear. And I think anyone who's worked in education for a long time would know that the better the rapport that you have with students, the less behaviour management issues you're going to have. And you would know from working, uh, if you work in, well, regardless of where you work, if your boss is someone that you really don't like. It's difficult to be motivated to go to work and to enjoy the work that you do and to put in that effort and to really um, really contribute and to go that extra mile. And the same applies for kids in a classroom because effectively that is their workplace as well. So I guess you could um, think of it in that sort of sense. Now, uh, 
Rapport building is one of those things where if you've ever, it's one of those things that high performing teachers, teacher aides, trainers, coaches, etc., are doing a lot of. They're constantly working on it. Now, some people do it naturally and they're just more extroverted or they're people type people um, and they naturally are, I guess they got the gift of the gab or they're a bit more charismatic, whereas other people need to actively work on rapport building and developing those relationships. And I think it's kind of a combination of the two. I think as part of your behavior management strategy, but also your sort of academic strategy and your, your general pedagogical approach or andragogical approach if you're teaching adults is to get in as much rapport building as you can. Of course, within reasons. And there's lots of different ways that we can do, go about doing it. Now, one of my favorite ways, or I think one of the most simplest ways, well, there's two real ways that I usually go about doing rapport building from a, I guess, from an activity point of view. I hate doing icebreakers, so I never do those. I think they're horrific. Um, but not to say that I don't, I don't recommend people don't do them, but I think they're just a waste of time. Um, but what I do is I normally talk to people at some point during the lesson. So usually that starts at the start. So there's, an, uh, there's a, a behavior management strategy called greet them at the door. And uh, what that means is that as students are walking in or before the lesson, you're circulating around and you're just saying, hi, John, how are you going? Hi, Sarah, how are you going? Hi, Peter, how are you going? So on and so forth. And you're having a bit of a conversation uh, with them. You're letting them know that you're aware that they exist as a human being and they're not just a number. And you're asking questions. What did you do on the weekend? So on and so forth. So I guess that is the first one that I'll put up and I'll just call that circulate. So the circulate method. And I think if there's only one thing that you remember from this, besides the fact that rapport building is good and that you should do a lot of it, is that as you circulate either during a lesson or before a lesson, after a lesson at recess or lunch or whatever, um, spend 10 seconds just asking a student, trying to develop a little bit of rapport, asking them a question, talking to, talking to them about their um, hobbies and pastimes and um, likes and dislikes and those types of things. Likes, dislikes, pastimes, hobbies, favorite thing to do on the weekend, um, uh, and just general information about, and just general information. So I guess I'll put that one up there as a separate thing. You're just getting to know them. And that can mean just a two second chat, but it, what I'd like to do is if I'm circulating in a room with a bunch of students, so. You go through, you do your examples on the board, they start doing their thing, and then you move from group to group and student to student or whatever. I usually do a bit of rapport building, just one for fun because it's enjoyable, but also because there are so many benefits of it. The other thing that happens with rapport building, by the way, is not only does it reduce behavioral issues, but rapport building is seen as credit in the bank. I'll write this up the top. I have no idea where I got that term from. I didn't invent it though, so I can't take credit for it, but credit in the bank basically means that you build up credit with the student um, and then when something happens, like they're in a bad mood or there's a fight in the playground or something, because you've got a rapport with them, um, you're able to deal with that situation, you're able to cash in your chips or cash in that credit, uh, I guess you can say. Um, so that's a, a, something of an analogy as far as how rapport building works. The better the rapport that you have with a student, the more likely they are to follow your instructions in emergencies or when things are all going wrong, and the more likely they are to become one of your allies. And if you work in really difficult and challenging classrooms, um, then you need to develop as many allies as you possibly can because then that prevents students from uh, forming gangs or forming what they call packs, uh, and then packs are very, very difficult to deal with. So um, the more allies you can get there, the better. So what I like to do is if I am circulating around, is I'll go to that group there, I'll sit or crouch or stand there or whatever, and I'll say, okay, how do you, what do you do on the weekend? 30 second chat, and then say, how are we going today? Do we know what's going on? Okay, good, and then move on to the next one. So that rapport building can take the form of just a quick 30 second chat as you walk in the door. Another little trick that I like to use uh, is a, I'm gonna call that notice objects or possessions. Yeah, just notice objects will do. So what that basically means is say a student's walking in the door, they got some weird funky shoes on, and you're just saying, where did you get those weird funky shoes from? They look like clown shoes, but in a good way, I like them. So you're just 
complementing them in some on some fashionable sense. Obviously, you've got to be really careful about doing that. So um, you know, just bear that in mind. Uh, you've got to think through what you say before you say it. Um, but noticing objects can be an interesting way. If students have got um, a, a backpack or they've changed their hair or something like that, that can be a good way to just let them know that you're paying attention, that they're not just number 722, that they're actually a human being. Another thing that you do is names. Now there are two ways, yeah, probably two ways. Obviously you can have nicknames and things, but that gets, again, uh, I'm not going to include that here because I think that's a high risk uh, strategy, but obviously having nicknames for students can uh, really help as well. But, um, and we'll write humor, uh, yeah, humor and tell them about yourself and professionalism, sorry, I'm just gonna write these up, is a good one, um, and some others will come to me in a minute. Okay, so using the names, there's basically two different ways you can do it. So firstly is called learn names fast. So I'm just gonna write learn fast, so you're learning their names really fast. And second one is using those honorifics, or what is known as honorifics, so um, saying, you know, uh, Mr. Green or whatever it is. So you're using that um, first name, uh, sorry, using that honorific, Mr., Miss, whatever, um, and their surname. So that's just a different way to let them know that you know who they are. And it's a little bit more respectful. It's a bit of a game, um, but again, uh, that can really uh, be an effective way of helping to develop um, developing to, to help develop rapport. So obviously you can use humor um, and the typical dad jokes, as they say. So just you're not aiming to have students rolling around on the floor laughing or in tears because you're so funny. That's not how humor works in terms of rapport building or in terms of a classroom management strategy. In fact, that would be quite unprofessional. Um, it's humor as in you're just making it lighthearted. So you might crack the occasional joke or you know, you, you're being, not being too overly serious and too stuck up, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're a comedian. So just bear that uh, in mind. Um, and you're telling students about yourself. Actually, that's another one, which is apologize. Uh, no. I don't like to say that. I like to say, say sorry. Yeah, so um, tell them about yourself as much as, not not as much as you can, that's not the right way to put it, but you're regularly letting students know about different aspects of your life and you're making connections with them. So, um, so for example, if a student says, oh, yeah, we're just moving house, we're moving to this particular suburb, then you could say something like, oh, I live at that suburb, what do you think about the Chinese restaurant there? Or what do you think about the isn't that road works really annoying or whatever. So you're making those connections with students. It's a, that's a really important way um, to help you build rapport. Um, it could be if you, uh, and there's another one, is follow up. And I'll get to that one in two seconds. But being able to make those connections to show where you're relating to them or you're relatable to them is an important aspect uh, of building rapport. So. Um, anyway, telling them about yourself and making connections, that's kind of related in a way, but that can be funny little anecdotes. It can mean you're just talking to students and you're saying stuff like, oh, yeah, so yesterday I was watching this movie. Has anyone seen this movie? Because on Sunday night I always watch a movie at about 7 o'clock. That's my routine or whatever. Um, you're letting them know personal facts about yourself and it helps you become more personable. Um, and if you can, yeah, if students are saying or you hear you're talking to a student and they say, yeah, on Saturday I went and played soccer or football or whatever and then you say, oh, I really like football. What team do you follow? Da, 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 da. So again, you're making those connections um, and you're saying sorry. Some people do this and they say sorry way too much. Uh, but for other people, as teachers, we seem to, or teacher aides or as adults teaching kids in particular, we never, we don't really say sorry enough. So you can use um, and also, not only that, but using I statements, what is known as I statements. So that's a separate thing. Um, and that means I feel uh, a little stressed out today. Or, look, I'm not having the best day. Or, I'd really appreciate it if you guys were able to do this. Or, I feel like today you're a bit off and it's making it difficult for me. Those types of things. So you're using those 
personal I statements that ex particularly when they explain how you feel and your expectations and so on and so forth. So that, again, it helps build rapport, but it also helps with behavior management because it's very difficult for um, other human beings. There's this natural instinct to um, have a certain amount of um, empathy and sympathy for um, other people. So um, don't be afraid to say, oh, sorry, everyone, I didn't photocopy this, or sorry, everyone, I forgot to do this, or sorry, I made this mistake on the board, or oh, sorry for that, I've sort of wasted a bit of time, or whatever. So um, feel free to um, you know, think about that. Some people, again, do say sorry every five minutes, uh, and whereas other people just never say it. So I think there's that sort of happy medium in there, again, that makes you sound more personable. Um, I'm just going to run up here to professionalism before we go down to follow-up. So by professionalism, what I mean is that you're dressing like a professional. If you want people to like you and to respect you, you need to be professional. Now, uh, one of the, I guess, the one of the problems, particularly in primary schools, I find, is that sometimes adults, whether they're teachers or teacher aides, dress like they should be dressed like they're having a sick day or something like that regardless of what other people are wearing it is important to see yourself as a professional and to always dress like a professional now that doesn't mean that you're dressing as if you were standing in front of a courtroom and you were a lawyer at the high court or whatever but it does mean that you need to dress appropriately um, as if you were uh, say at a parent teacher conference or something like that Within reason, you do need to be able to, if you're playing sport or you're on the ground with kids all the time for whatever activity, you need to dress for that particular occasion, but should always be neat, always be sharp. You should always uh, follow the dress code of your school. Um, but I, will, I, I do like to note that because we regularly see people, uh, you know, teachers and teacher aides who are not meeting the dress code um, the, I guess the unwritten dress code and are frankly dressed like slobs. So um, I think if you want the respect of your students, then you need to dress professionally. That's really important, whatever that definition is for you. Okay, so the fin final thing, uh, and sorry, but that, it's, that, that aspect there, it's not only just in the dress, but it's also in the way that you're carrying yourself. So you've got that confidence, you've got that, you're thinking about your tone and your volume and your body language, and you're also organized and you're using a range of teaching strategies and you have a high level of pedagogical knowledge or andragogical knowledge if you're working with adults. So that means, I guess, the art and slash science of teaching. You really know what you're talking about. You know the different strategies and how to implement them. Um, you're confident in what you're doing and in your abilities, not only in the content that you're teaching, but also in the way in which you're going about um, scaffolding and using various different strategies um, uh, to uh, help facilitate learning. Now, the last one that I'll talk about is follow-up. Follow-up basically means that if you come in, uh, let's say on a Thursday, you're talking to a student and you say, oh yeah, what's going on on the weekend? What's happening? And the student goes, well, um, I'm playing this particular sport on uh, Saturday. And you say, oh yeah, cool. What team do you play for? What position? Yada, yada, yada. You have a little chat about it. So what you need to do is on Monday, uh, when that student comes in, say, how'd you go in your game? Did you win? And they'll say, oh yeah, da, 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 no, I lost, or I scored a goal, or I didn't, or whatever. So you're doing that follow-up. And that shows, well, that helps with a lot of these things, the like and dislike, helps to get to know them, and so on and so forth. Um, not so much humor in that, but um, it shows that you are taking the time and the cognitive effort to remember information about them. And you might be surprised, uh, that one's... You, the students might be surprised that you actually remember that information. And nothing surprises students even more than when they say something and then four months later or two months later, you say, um, they might tell you in February, say that they're going on a holiday somewhere in, say, the end of the term. And then after that term, you say, how was your holiday to X, Y, Z? Uh, and the student will be like, well, how do you remember I'm going on this holiday? Oh, you told me at the start of the year. I just, I remember these things. Um, so anyway, that's basically what follow-up is and it's a really uh, effective way to build rapport. So the other thing that happens when you're developing or you have developed or you're on the way to developing a lot of rapport with students is the lesson and uh, the, the activities and the group discussions and things like that just become so much more enjoyable, not only for students, 
but also for the uh, whoever's working in that class, teachers, T-Trade, support staff, or whatever, it just becomes such a more pleasant environment to work in. And we call that classroom dynamic. So the general environment, uh, I'm just gonna call that CD for now. Oh, I suppose I could write it up, because again, I know people like to take screenshots and things. Classroom dynamic. Yeah, yeah, yeah self-esteem too. Oops. Sorry, I just thought of another one that I'm going to put up. Self-esteem. Okay, cool. So it helps build that classroom dynamic. So there's my little arrow that goes up. That rapport is one of the best ways to build that um, that sense that you walk into a room and you might have felt this before you walk into a room and the kids are all happy and the teacher seems happy or the teacher aids and everything's going well and everyone's not stressed out the other thing that happens with rapport building too is if there are problems remember you've got that credit in the bank if there are any problems instead of it building into this massive escalating issue it can normally be dealt with really quickly because you know the student the student knows you um, and people are a lot more forgiving when they have that higher level of rapport. It prevents these massive escalations that gets out of control and allows you to deal with situations very quickly. So um, if you've got teaching year nines, for example, once you get a really good rapport with them, if they're mucking around and being stupid, you can say, Oi, stop being idiots. So, but you wouldn't be able to say that to people that you don't know, but because you've got a good relationship with them, you can say, guys, Stop being stupid. Sit down, do your work. I'll be over there in 10 minutes. You're acting like clowns. You can get away with that if you've got a good amount of rapport, solves the problem straight away, and isn't considered rude. It's got, you can see how there's that little bit of humor in there. Not quite humor, but approaching humorous anyway. Maybe not. Um, but it's light. It's not aggressive or stern. Whereas if you don't have that rapport, um, then the actual response to those students has to be uh, more... I wouldn't want to use the word professional, impersonal. So it has to follow the stringent, right, if you're behaving like this, the consequence is X or whatever. Whereas if you've got that rapport, you can go through that process. Now, just one last final thing or two final things. One, obviously that helps improve student self-esteem, particularly this day and age where some students are from single parent households and things like that. So it does help students build that self-esteem. You can help them set goals. Um, and so on and so forth, because they're developing those relationships, they're achieving goals, they're more willing to participate. And if you're combining this stuff with coping strategies, transferable skills, and metacognitive skills, and a wide range of different teaching strategies, then that's certainly going to go a long way in boosting students' self-esteem, not just now, but in the future as well. And the last thing I was going to say about credit in the bank and this sort of concept that every time you build rapport, it's like a savings account. You're saving up money that you can withdraw when you need to. So the example I like to use is, um, let's say you're at an assembly and there's a couple of kids in your class that you've got a good rapport with, and these are a pain in the ass kids that are always misbehaving and so on and so forth. If you've got a good rapport with them, then you could look at them when they're 10 metres away and sort of go, and they'll do what you say. Whereas if a teacher or teacher aide who doesn't have that rapport, they're going to either ignore you or start talking or, um, or whatever. So having that rapport enables you to deal with those situations so much more effectively than if you didn't. But also imagine another scenario where, say you're at the, well, not an assembly, say you're in the playground, two students are fighting. If you have rapport with both or even one of those students, you can walk up and say, stop it, whatever, and they're more than likely going to. Whereas if there's a, a, an adult who has no rapport with them, there's emotions everywhere, it's a high strung sort of environment, um, students are red in the face, they've been punched a couple of times or whatever, they might think, well, I don't know this person, I don't care what you say, and they're just going to keep fighting or whatever. Whereas because you have a good rapport with them, and I've seen this happen in schools all the time, the teacher who they know, or teacher aide who they know, walks up and says, right, that's it, you there, you there, and it's over. Whereas there might already be two other teachers there and it not um, nothing be happening because and students aren't stopping because, again, they lack that rapport. So that's my take on rapport building and a bunch of different ways in which you can uh, easily develop rapport with kids. It starts the minute that that lesson starts on day one and it continues right up to the very end of the year. Um, the other thing I like to say about rapport building, just to sign off, is that 
not only is it easy, but it's free. It doesn't really, it doesn't take any time. It doesn't cost you any money, but the benefits, particularly the medium and long-term benefits are just phenomenal. So please use rapport building uh, as a strategy, as an ongoing strategy, um, not as a chore, um, but as something that is uh, a professional skill, whether you're working with kids or adults or not even outside the education sector. So um, enjoy.